Quindi lì è And how is everyone this evening? Okay, that wasn't half bad. I'll, I'll give you credit for that. But... We'll, we'll see if we'll get some proper laughs out of some people. We'll see if we can get your, keep and hold your attention for any particular length of time. Uh, I have some brand new material I'm going to try out on you, so. Yeah. So you won't hear the Berlin story for like the eighth fucking time. Bring my God, it's so good. Yeah, it holds, up, it holds up very well, but I'm now at the point where it's kind of turning into one of those ones where I'm saving it for the special occasion. So uh, with that in mind, the 15th is coming up. So. Which keeps, see, we've got a few things to discuss before we throw our first act up here. First of all, you might notice that there's a chair, and on that chair, there's a picture. And in that picture, there's a sign that says the American Cancer Society. Um, we're taking donations. If you happen to, after supporting this wonderful place by buying some food, having a drink, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if you've got some money left over, drop a few bucks in there. Um, one of the members of the samurai recently had kind of a scare with cervical cancer, so right about now we're totally in that mode of supporting that group. Um, so keep that in mind. For those of you who are interested, it's kind of an open night in a strange sort of way coming up this Saturday with what we're calling the Virgo's birthday party. Um, because uh, it's on Saturday, September 15th, which is my birthday. Um, and then the day after, I believe, is Marlo Mapes' birthday. And then Allison Ficklin, who is another member of the Samurai, who isn't here this evening but will be there next time, uh, is going to be at this particular one. And her birthday is also, it was like two days ago, I think. So I don't know how a collection of Virgos got fucking involved in this thing, but, you know, somebody's got to organize it. Uh, well, you know what you're doing? You're doing the right question. Right? I don't know. Maybe you just haven't like, jumped a few people yet. Yeah, maybe you haven't. I missed the show, which no. annoys me even more. Well, yeah. Yeah. A typical Tuesday around here. Come on in. Join us. I will. I will. Okay. I'm waiting for my friend. Oh, cool. We don't try to scare people away. So that is uh, Saturday, September 15th. There's going to be some, it's going to basically be a birthday party slash mini show. There's going to be about four or five people coming up. There will be some short sets. There will be some craziness. I don't know what else is going to happen. Um, but I have always said that the really cool part about a samurai show is actually the show that happens when we're done. Um, because almost inevitably, the first thing that happens is, is we cross the street to Lover's Luxuries, uh, which that's entertainment in and of itself. You turn the collection of us loose in a rubber dick store, and it gets it. It's, the comedy begins and almost never ends. It was a one, easy one of those. And then we take pictures of the family doing the oddest things. Actually, the family takes pictures of me doing the weirdest things, too. And I'm amazed she hasn't blackmailed me yet. To be fair, it was the wand art of butt plugs. You have to document that. Oh, yeah, that's a gimme, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, and then after that, we almost inevitably wind up at Beercade, and if you've not been there, I I'm not even getting paid to say this, but um, their selection is wonderful, and I've almost been carried out of that place on several different occasions. Um, and then, let me see, the 24th, which is also, I believe, a Monday, uh, we're going to be having our Samurai Spotlight show, which means that two people will be doing longer sets, and we did this earlier with myself and the family, and it went really well. On um, the next show, we decided to kind of do a yin-yang sort of thing. So we're having Christopher Wig and Mikey Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to be there. <laughs> it just, if for no other reason, I'm just going to like watch the shock effect going from one to the other. And then October 1st, I don't know why they keep bringing us back, although I am not complaining about it. The slowdown is going to be having us, and that will also be on a Monday. So come on down, check us out, enjoy the show. And with that in mind, we're going to begin today with an audition, but Christopher Wig actually asked to bring up our first uh, victim. Something along those lines. So, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Wig. So I'll make this pretty brief and short. It was about a year and a half ago or so, I was finding myself sort of hitting a dry spell of not performing and for those of you that don't know I used to be a professional actor and I used to do a lot of theater local here and uh, I stopped doing that when I joined the corporate world because I kind of started feeling my soul being taken away by the giant vampire and I didn't want to do anything else and so I started finding myself 
wanting to find a muse. I needed somebody that was, uh, I needed like a big breasted blonde mythical lady to come into my life and to sing to me and to inspire art and to inspire creation and to, to make some of something happen, to, to get that motivation and it didn't happen. Instead they sent me the polar opposite. <laughs> which would be Tomas, who is the most, one of the most genuine people I've ever met with uh, so much drive and, and soul and, and ambition, and that's a really funny choice of words there, Tomas. Uh, but I wanted to say uh, thank you personally for literally helping me kind of get back on this creative road to doing stuff and to do some of these speaking engagements and to write and to film and to want to do that. Um, and it's great when you find somebody that, that brings that. And this person is that person to me. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to put your hands together and bring up my friend, Tomas C. All right, everybody, come on, give it to me. Come on, let's start. Let's start. No, I'm just playing. I've been wanting to see you a little bit. Uh, I rap, Chris. You want to say another one? Everything he said, uh, I, I can say it, but you all know him, and, and he's a special guy, and the words can't even explain it. So, <laughs> the reason I started off like that, other than my rap, is the piece that I wrote. Uh, it's very, it's like a heart-wrenching personal story, and I demoed it for my wife yesterday, and I got choked up, and sometimes I had to stop all together, and I was thinking, you know, I'm a rapper, and you know rappers, all you do is rob old ladies and, and punch babies in the face. <laughs> So, I'm thinking if I started crying or choking up, then, you know, it wouldn't be good. So, I'm going to use the visual of you guys clapping in the beginning if I start to, to laugh. And feel free to do like some beat me. You know, if I start crying, so I start laughing, right? So, when this piece is called uh, A Forgotten Son of God. And uh, it's really a story about for forgiving people and the power of forgiving people, but it also sets up the one thing you need to know about me, which is that I'm a very socially awkward person. And Welcome to Chris <laughs> 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 and Chris more than anybody because I spend most of my day thanking Chris. And it's not just because Chris uh, helped uh, move my major career forward faster than it was, which was a snail pace. But most of the time it's just because he's my friend. And so I'll invite him over and I'll cook this eight course dinner and serve it and, and I'll have drinks and I'll put pillows behind him and mess with him and start the world. And when he leaves, I'm like, thanks, Chris, thanks, man, for hanging out with me. Thanks for being a friend. And he's like, yeah, man, you're welcome. It's it's cool, man. You know, and you're like, you weirdo. And I'm like, you know, it's just because I appreciate friendship like that because I've, I've never really had it. So, uh, to kind of start the story, I was born December 17, 1982, to a beautiful woman named Josephine Couturis. And she is the most hardworking, loving, uh, creative person that I've ever met in my life, and I owe everything to her. And on the flip side of that, the first player in this story, there's two main players, was a man named Arthur Pinterest, and he was her husband and my father. So he was, for lack of a better description, a piece of fucking shit. And <laughs> the reason I say that is because he's very uh, manipulative, uh, verbally, emotionally, and physically abusive person who, if I told you the stories prior to me and my sister, you, sh you either choke up or you wouldn't believe me because they were so ter terrible. I didn't believe them. And 
this kind of went on uh, with just him and my mom until he had us, and my sister before me, and then me. And it didn't take too long before he had decided I was old enough to be a part of this and for him to inflict his, his uh, abuse on me. And one of my earliest memories is playing on the floor with my little X-Men toys and, you know, back then I was just as imaginative as, as I was now when I get into these stories and I lose myself for hours. And I guess he must have told me to be quiet or shut up. And, or I guess he, he did. I give, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that he did. But when I was a kid, uh, you don't register that right away. You, know, you have to be told like two or three times to be quiet or shut up. And, and the next thing I remember is an object hitting me in the mouth. And it was, it was one of my toys. And, uh, you know, instantly the, the tears go in your eyes and, and they're very hot and, and then the next thing you, you notice is the blood in your mouth and that's a sour taste you can never get used to. And I remember looking at my senior get off the couch and he would come towards me and I, I think he's going to grab me in my arms and, and maybe say uh, he was sorry, uh, that maybe he didn't mean to, to throw it that hard or maybe at my face. And instead of grabbing me on my arms and picking me up, he grabbed me on the outside and, and he, he brought me in, he looked at me, and he got really close and really quiet. And he said, <clears throat> if you tell your mom, I'm going to beat the fucking shit out of you. I'm going to go to the bathroom and clean up. And so, grabbing my toys and do that. And it doesn't really register you register to you at that age because this person is someone you love and you trust and and even, even the next day or the next morning, you forget about it. And you love them because you trust them. And, and, and you, you just believe that they're there to protect you. So you, you kind of, you just bury it. But uh, the main memory that kind of set up everything <clears throat> uh, for the next you know, few years was uh, often at night, uh, me and my sister shared a room because there was two rooms, one upstairs and, and ours downstairs, and, and we would talk in the dark. And it was mostly kid stuff, like, you know, whatever, what we did that day, but uh, a lot of the times it ended up being about um, the abuse we saw that he did to my mom, like beating her and, and choking her and pushing her against the wall. And uh, sometimes it would be what happened to me. And uh, I remember, the stairs. It would be the, the first step, and then he'd be at the bottom in no time. And most of the time, I would just freeze and in fear and, and bundle up and lay there because it was it just happened so fast. But often I was able to get enough courage to, to run up the stairs uh, to the top of my sister, and I would get behind her and, and I put the covers up on me and I, I, I digged into her back so, so far in the edge and I closed my eyes till they started pinching and hurting and, and I get quiet and I, I think that if I did that, that I could uh, disappear. If I, if I did it fast enough and hard enough and, and deep enough in there that, that I, I would, he couldn't find me. <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah. So, uh, but it, it, of course, it never worked, and <clears throat> the plane would, would fly off, and he grabbed me by my hair, and he <clears throat> threw me off the top, and I'd hit the ground, and, and I'd lose my breath, and, and he threw me into the bed hard enough to hit the wall that the bed was laid against, and <clears throat> if that wasn't the end of the story, uh, he would notice that I peed the bed, and, uh, if you've ever seen the devil in somebody's eyes, <coughs> that was it. And he would call me a bitch and a punk, and he'd pick me up again and say, you know, get this, get this shit up and, and take it off and, and put it in the laundry room and fix your bed. And, and then uh, <coughs> that memory, till I was about 12 years old, and 
I'm a very vivid dreamer. I, uh, Monica can attest, I, I dream so vividly at night that I wake up in the morning and I feel like I slept maybe 30 minutes because my mind's been racing all night. And that dream, until I was 12, uh, had me wet the bed almost every night. And uh, so eventually my mom uh, gets tired of this and she leaves him and gets, gets, gets the courage uh, to leave him and, and uh, I never heard from him again. And in comes the second player who I believe has made me uh, the, the awkward person I am. So kind of go back a couple years, uh, December 17, 1982, the second player, his name is Jimmy Lee Travis, and he is my uh, mom's younger brother. And to, to kind of let you know who he was, is uh, he's a very charismatic, loving, caring person. Everybody loves him. The minute they meet him, they're, 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 that's their best friend. And he's, he, worked for the Union, he works for the Union Pacific, and he's been doing this since he was in his early 20s, and he was the uh, president of the Union. So he's a very successful person, but most of all, just charming, charismatic, sarcastic, funny guy. And uh, at that time, he wasn't talking to my mom because my dad, who was a chicken shit, uh, had said a couple of things to my grandma, and he was going to beat her up, beat him up, and my dad uh, made my mom hide him. And so at that time, they weren't talking, but when he had me, when they had me, they started bringing me to my grandma's house, and that's where my uncle lived. And they said that he loved me from the very first minute he saw me. And that he was a dual, he adored me. And he would spend so much time with me, it was kind of weird because he was, uh, he was a young man and himself. He could have been at a party, but he spent a lot of time playing with me and, and taking me in his 86 rig, which to, to this day I think is the most, the coolest car I've ever seen in my life because he still owns it. And, <laughs> And he let me take him to prom, and uh, yeah, but well, I had the zoom suit on too, so I was looking nice. So he would let me sit on his lap and pretend like the police were coming, and then I I get down, and, and then uh, when my dad left, and my mom found out that the money that she had been giving him for the uh, mortgage payment was going to drugs, she filed bankruptcy, lost the house, lost the car, lost everything, ended up in a, in a one room house. And he kind of picked up the pieces, and he took me to his house every or every weekend. If if there was a weekend, I was with him, and I was, and he would take me. He taught me how to play baseball, and he taught me how to play football, and he taught me how to be uh, carefree again and, and be happy. And uh, the biggest thing was is is. When my mom needed to buy clothes for me for every year, he was the one who bought it. And during that time, I got older, he would take me to movies, and he would take me uh, to comedy shows, and, and we just became best friends, but most importantly, he was like my dad. And if you could imagine being that young, your best friend, the only person you hang out with is some 30-year-old guy, you think like a 30-year-old. Your, your, your comedy is like a 30-year-old. Your sarcasm. And when you're around kids, they don't understand that. So uh, I was always a loner, and nobody wanted to be my friend, and nobody understood my jokes or what sarcasm was. And so I really didn't have anybody but him. And it was amazing, and, and I felt like I had a dad. So that transition between being a uh, fatherless in a family where everybody had a dad, it kind of didn't exist for me because of him. And things went on like that for, for a long time. And then, of course, as everybody knows, uh, everything has to change. Everything changes. And nothing can be like that forever. And his wife, my aunt Ray, had had a son. And, of course, I wanted it to be a girl because I didn't want to lose my dad. But when I first saw him, I fell in love with him. His name's Nick. And he was my second best friend. And as a, even as a tiny little baby, he would sleep with me downstairs at this third, three-story house in the dark basement, and he would trust me and love me, and he, he was never afraid, and, and everything was great. And my uncle had two other kids, and, and everything was perfect, and I was the oldest. 
that's that's kind of how it was. That's kind of how all his friends saw me, because uh, everywhere they went, I was there, and they had known me since I was little, Tommy. And as they got older and could play sports, because my uncle was big into sports, and I'm big into arts, as you can tell, everything kind of changed. Um, I was the, the joke to him because rapping was kind of like the ha ha ha. MC broke is what he called me, and, <laughs> and it was you know it was just it wasn't anything to take seriously. It was just you, you know I was the brunt of all of his jokes, and he spent every waking moment with his with his kids, and uh, eventually everything changed. Uh, no comedy shows, no movies, no phone calls, um, no best friend, nobody to hang out with. And I would get the, every so once in a while, you want to babysit the kids on a Friday so I can go out uh, with your aunt. And I, I kind of started to resent him. And the things that kind of just set everything into motion was I graduated from high school and the newspaper comes out and he's a newspaper junkie and when you graduate they put a newspaper out that, that uh, tells everybody what scholarships you got and so I got three scholarships and I was proud of them because they weren't like you're Hispanic and you're poor here's a scholarship you know what it, it was you worked your ass off you wrote these papers you had good grades here's your scholarships and he called me, and it was early in the morning, so I knew he was coming in because of it, and I was so excited and proud. And I remember that uh, when he called, he said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. And he said, uh, I just read the paper, and, and uh, I just wanted to tell you how embarrassed I was that you had three scholarships, and all my friends' kids had six or seven, whatever, and been doing for four years. <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, I kind of lost it, and I, I kind of cried. Uh, a couple weeks later, what, what kind of ended everything was uh, he told me that I'm going to take my boys and, <laughs> and my family to see the Husker game in Lincoln. And I said, I said, okay, that's cool. And that was it. That was kind of the end of, of the dad best friend relationship. And, and I kind of spiraled into darkness because having that best friend and that dad allowed me to never think about what had happened to me when I was from that. And so when you don't have any friends and you don't have a dad, you have a lot of free time and you start thinking about those things. And they all came back and I, I, I spiraled into this drinking binge. And I did have one friend from high school, just one, and he wasn't a good friend, he was a user. And I would invite him over every night uh, after class and, and I would beg him to stay. And I'd buy him drinks, and then I'd buy 12 packs, 12 packs, cases, and I said, oh, come on, just one more hour, one more hour, and, and he would, most of the times, you know, sometimes he wouldn't, but he would, but then eventually the beer ran out, and it got late, and I was sad, and, and just along with my thoughts and, and my loneliness. And I, I reached the breaking point one Christmas, and I got these pills, and I got uh, I got these pills, and I got this uh, alcohol, and I, and I was gonna kill myself. And it wasn't one of those uh, write a letter or send people texts. I always loved you type of attempts. It was I just got it, and I stayed home, and and I was gonna do it. And my mom showed up right before it happened, and pretty much saved, saved me from killing myself. And I wish I could say that that was a turning point in my life, but it wasn't. What it took was my mom had a stroke a few years later. And I almost lost the, the most important thing that ever happened to me, my mom. And that very moment when I found out, I, I changed my life and I bounced back and I took 
work series and I enrolled in college and I worked extra hours uh, to pay for my mom's medication and I started working out and lost all the weight that I had gained and, and I, I was starting to feel really great about myself and me and my uncle Jimmy just we just never talked in years sometimes months and the time came where I met this woman who I love very much, and she liked a, a status on my friend's page, so I'm like, I'm gonna add her. So I, I added her, and she accepted, and I said, yes. So I'm like, yeah. She's just because she looked like a model in the picture, and I was like, oh my God. So I click on her page after she added me, and it said Texas. And I'm like, oh God, I think, just my fucking love, this woman was in Texas, and, and I, I I wrote her and I said, uh, oh, I liked one of her statuses and then she writes me back and she says, when well, you collect pretty girls on Facebook? And I said, well, none as pretty as you. And <laughs> she, she, uh, she liked that. And uh, so we became just instant lovers. And we would spend the whole night till six in the morning talking to each other every day. And it, four months passed and in December, um, I couldn't walk, sit, or stand without the use of a cane because of a spinal degenerational disease. And I told her, and she said, well, I was about to lose my apartment, my house, my job, everything, because I didn't have insurance, so they wouldn't do a procedure. And uh, she says, I'm coming. I'm coming down there. I don't care. I'm coming down there. Uh, I'm going to be there the 1st of 2010, January. And she did. And four months later, I got my surgery. And my uncle shows up. And you can tell he's pissed. He showed up because I, he loved me. I was, I was his, like his other son, no matter what. And he showed up and he was pissed. He said hi. And he's like, I'm taking your mom and, and Monica out to lunch. And that's kind of where everything changed. Because he loved Monica so much that he considered me a man at that point. <laughs> now, mind you, I wasn't a man when I was going to school full time, working 60 hours a week, taking care of my mom, cleaning her laundry, buying her prescriptions. But when I met Monica and he knew I was going to get married, I was a man. I, he just loved her that much. And so our relationship kind of built again and, and we started talking. and. And we got close, and, and the time came after a year that me and Monica decided we wanted to elope to Vegas to get married. And he came with us with my mom and my sister, and he kind of played the role of dad again. And he was my best man, and he paid for this huge dinner with her family, and with her family, of course, falling in love with him instantly and calling him Uncle Jimmy within 10 minutes. And he gave this great speech about his son, and, and uh, it felt great. And so we come back to Omaha, we're living our lives, and everything's great. And uh, I go to walk this one Saturday, and I start at 6.30 uh, a.m. every morning, and I go out, and I get caught in a rainstorm. And it's about three miles to where my car is. And I'm sitting under the bridge, and I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm talking to myself, which is another reason why I'm so awkward because I talk to myself and I have conversations with myself where I argue with myself and I get into arguments. <laughs> so, and Monica will get into us today. She's got me doing it. And, uh, and I had this feeling, this, this, this thing hit me and it was, it was so real. Uh, I can't even explain it, but it was like a realization. And I sat there and I thought, you know, I hated him for so many years because I thought he was a bad dad for abandoning me, abandoning me when I needed him the most. And I, I thought and I said, you know, I had a dad. No, I have a dad. And he doesn't give a fuck about me. For all he knew, I was dead or in prison. And he spent the rest of his life or the life up to that point, ducking and dodging child support, quitting jobs, so he didn't have to pay for us. And this, this man, this imperfect, loving, caring man who didn't know the first thing about raising a son. <laughs> so 
took that, that place in my life, and he was imperfect with flaws. And so I thought, was he a bad dad? Or was he the best uncle a forgotten son of God could have ever asked for? Thank you. I hope you're ready for kind of the spoken word equivalent of a groin pull. Um, because we're going from one direction into another. Um, we, we kind of hide her over here. Uh, you, you might have noticed that. Um, not, not because of any particular deformity. Um, My sense of shame is awfully deformed and you know it. Yeah, your sense of shame got removed in surgery or something. Um, not that you should ever have one. I mean, not, you know, I'm going to be getting up and talking after she's done, and believe me, there's some stuff in there that I should probably be ashamed of. There's probably a few things in there that I'm really grateful that I'll be talking about them because they are way, way past the point where I could possibly be prosecuted for them, but we'll discuss that later. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so with that in mind, um, her name is just Sophia, but that's kind of like knowing the Lone Ranger's name, ladies and gentlemen of Emily. Hi, everybody. Why, thank you. And funny you should mention that because I have some very dear friends that are uh, big into like tabletop games and board games and that sort of thing. And, Actually, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about this evening was you know, some of my gaming history, some of which, which involves this gentleman right there. <laughs> We're going to tell that story. So, um, but it only occurred to me after I got here that there is a, uh, um, an investigator in the um, Arkham Horror realm. If you've never played it, it's basically the HP Lovecraft board game, and it's fantastic. And Jenny Barnes is the dilettante. And the first time I ever played the game, I played that particular investigator, and we basically slaughtered everything with it. And the, uh, the catchphrase of the day was, do you like my hat? Because she has the hat, the derringer, the dress, and all of that. So it was only on the drive over here when I'm trying to keep my hat on my head that I realized, hey, I'm doing my best Jenny, uh, Jenny Barnes impression. <coughs> but uh, I do keep a blog. I, uh, I did not have a chance to put out my business cards or calling cards this evening because today is <laughs> I am the chief pilot on seat of your pants airlines today. I managed to forget to set my alarm and some of you who are on my Facebook list know that I recently started a new job. <laughs> Thankfully I live quite literally across the street. So it was run through the shower, almost literally, and uh, run across Play Frogger on Dodge Street, that's fun, <laughs> quite literally. So, um, and I don't run. So to see me lurch forward in a speedy manner was quite entertaining, I'm sure, to just about everybody. But I do, have, I do have my cards over here. They're just not out. So if you should want to know what the blog address is, that sort of thing, you're welcome to them. Ephemily.org, if you trust your handwriting more than Vistaprint. So, but I want to start off with some of my gaming past, which Mr. Chris Wig, which you talk about with this, was a part of. Now, I was a, uh, I actually went to, trip hazard, somebody call OSHA. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually went to North, and a lot of my gaming friends went to Central, so I was kind of that weird kid that just hung out on weekends, that sort of thing, but growing up, we had this palatial house that had lots and lots of amenities, and it was also old and dark and spooky and fantastic, so being that this was the 90s, LARPing was still not quite as crazy, kooky, oh my god, you need a shower-esque. <laughs> that kind of, you know, con funk didn't quite exist yet. So we would, uh, well, in, in, in not the same degree, because there were fewer cons. So, you know, there were more mothers that would haul their sons and daughters out of their basement and go soap. So, actually, 
Uh, on a totally unrelated note, that was the second day of uh, junior high. Our vice principal sat us all down in, in seventh grade and says, all right, kids, if you want friends, you need to take a shower and you need, you need to use soap. Well, that was blunt. <laughs> and I'm really glad he did. <laughs> but um, anyway, it was after one, one particular night when we had gotten done doing whatever brooding vampire-esque thing that it was that we did at that time before, you know, before Goodwill was cool, which is where we all went to get our little vampire-esque outfits and that sort of thing. But to cool off, because, you know, we had to wear the, the frills and the head-to-toe black and all of this, we had decided to go swimming because we had this pool. And, of course, me being one of the very few girls in this particular gaming circle, I had to get cute. So we're all out in the pool, and it's in ground, and it's got a, a light in it, so you can swim at night, and it's really quite neat. And we have Chris and several other people who are, I call them the geeky linebackers, because you guys were just big guys, just imposing, don't want to mess with you. And, and here I am in my little inflatable donut pool float. <laughs> paddle, 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 hee hee, look at me, I'm so cute. You know, like high school girls are want to be. And I didn't even remember what time it was, maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, something like that. And these creatures start swooping down like this. And you guys, I remember, I don't, I don't think it was planned, so there was no bathing suits involved. It was, I'm in my shorts and my t-shirt, and of course it's my house, so I had my cute little one-piece modest outfit um, for the pool. And I'm sitting in that donut just looking around, doing my thing. These guys are standing in the water, being all tough, because, you know, tough guys don't swim. They stand in the shallow end and, and look tough. <laughs> so I'm floating around, doing my thing, and these guys are just kind of looking up, because this is out by Humble Park, you know, where it's nice and dark, and you're on top of that hill, and, you know, you're under threat of an albino attack. And... <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. Yeah, see, that had to have been it. Well, you remember we had that, that gigantic Great Pyrenees dog. Yep. So that was the, the albino hellhound right there. <laughs> but so they're looking at this going, just isn't it a little bit late for birds? And of course, I'm in my little pool float. Going, oh, guys, those aren't birds. Those are bats. I have never seen you guys move so fast in my life. I mean, the only thing that would have made it more comical to me would have been a flurry of bobby pins and a cackle. Like, what's her bucket, the witch from the Looney Tunes? Witch Hazel. Witch Hazel, that would be her. This, this is why I love you guys. So that's that's really, that was the moment. Because I'm, I'm, I'm mid-paddle twirl on my little float donut. And all I hear is, after I say, those are bats, all I hear is this splashing. And I'm thinking, they're just going, oh God, no, get them away. No, they have made the 50 yard dash from the pool up into the house. And no amount of giggling or, or cajoling or nothing is gonna get them back outside. And I love you guys for it, I really do. So that, that was something that I wrote under the title of light-footed linebackers. Should anyone want to read the actual account of it? <laughs> <laughs> but in that vein, I know most times I perform my own original stuff, and I wanted to shake it up a little bit tonight. Um, <laughs> I actually totally forgot about the show tonight. This is something that I had planned a couple weeks ago and just neglected to look over it again. So I had wanted to originally do this as a duet, but you know, seat of the pants airline. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Eric and the Dread Gazebo? You've heard of it? Okay. Okay. Some of you who have heard of it know how amazing it is. So then the rest of you will discover. Um, there are several bits of humor and, and things on the internet that I have found over the years that are kind of inspirational. And this is one of them. Um, I don't know where the source is for this. I just know that uh, if you do a Google search for Eric and the Gazebo or Eric and the Dread Gazebo, you'll find out about it. I'm going to go ahead and read this particular print off as in my best dramatic reading uh, voice. Uh, let's see. Let us cast our minds back to the early days of fantasy role playing, back when ye dread Gaiax was loose upon the land. Funny how humor and horror can start out so alike. Let us go still earlier. Yes, it is permitted to breathe sighs of relief. 
to the days before Gygax, and I'm butchering that, uh, and the courts. Through that, he owned FRFP. It was the early 70s. Ed Whitechurch ran his game, and one of the participants was Ed Sorensen, or I'm sorry, Eric Sorensen, a veritable giant of a man. This story is essentially true. I know both Ed and Eric, and neither denies it, although Eric, for reasons that will become apparent later, never repeats it either. If my telling of it does not match the actual events precisely, it is because I've heard it many different ways, depending on how much of what type of intoxicants Ed had taken recently. The gist of it is that Eric, well, you need a, a little bit more about Eric, or else it won't fit, fill quota. Eric comes quite close to being a computer. When he games, he methodically considers each possibility before choosing his preferred option. If given time, he will invariably pick the optimum solution. It has been known to take weeks. <laughs> he is otherwise, in all respects, a superior gamer. And I've spent many happy hours competing with and against him as long as he has given enough time. So Eric was playing a neutral paladin. Why should only lawful good religions get to have holy warriors was his thinking. Uh, he even had a holy sword, which fought well and did all those things holy swords are supposed to do, including detect good. Random die roll, it could have detected evil. He was on some lord's land when the following exchange occurred. Ed, who is the GM, you see a well-groomed garden. In the middle, on a small hill, you see a gazebo. A gazebo? What color is it? <laughs> it's white, Eric. How far away is it? About 50 yards. How big is it? It's about 30 feet across, 15 feet high, with a pointed top. I used my sword to detect a good on it. It's not good, Eric. It's a gazebo. <laughs> I call out to it. It won't answer. It's a gazebo. I sheathe my sword and draw my bow and arrow. Does it respond in any way? No, Eric, it's a gazebo! I shoot it with my bow. Uh, Roll to hit. What happened? There was now a gazebo with an arrow sticking out of it. <laughs> Wasn't it wounded? <laughs> of course not, Eric! It's a gazebo! <laughs> but that was a plus three arrow! <laughs> it's a gazebo, Eric. A gazebo! If you really want to try to destroy it, you could try and chop it with an axe, I suppose, or you could try to burn it. But I don't know why anybody would even try. It's a gazebo! <laughs> Long pause. He has no axe or fire spells. I run away. <laughs> the GM through, I'm sure, what is clenched teeth in a very exact, uh, exasperated tone says, it's too late. You've woken it up. You've woken up the gazebo and it catches you and eats you. <laughs> Eric, still not getting the joke, reaching for his dice, says, maybe I'll roll up a fire using mage so I can avenge my paladin. <laughs> and this is why, ladies and gentlemen, vocabulary is very, very important. <laughs> This is just one of the examples of one of the many things on the internet that I find endlessly entertaining. Um, again, anonymous, I'm not sure who the author is, but it's fantastic. So, anybody uh, a fan of Killer Bunnies, the board game? Have you seen the gazebo card? Yeah. Now it makes more sense, right? Yeah. So, there's a couple of other people out there in the world that, uh, that really inspire me. One of which, who I don't have anything to read, is Celia Rivenbark. She, um, she, I believe it does a syndicated column in the South, but she has several books. Um, one of them is entitled, um, You Don't Sweat Much for a Fat Girl, or let's see what it, some of the other ones, Bless Your Heart, Tramp, and she's just, she's got this wonderful voice of Southern and humor, and uh, if you have a chance to pick anything of hers up, do it. Celia Rivenbark, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. But uh, the last piece I wanted to read is uh, <laughs> pretty much for the ladies in the room and anybody who has been around a, a mature woman. It is by a Wendy Ahrens and is an open letter to James Thatcher, brand manager of Procter & Gamble. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Some of you may have heard this as I get into it. It's hilarious. Dear Mr. Thatcher, I have been a loyal user of your Always Maxi Pads for over 20 years, and I appreciate many of their features. Why, without the lead guard curl or dry weave absorbency, I'd probably never go horseback riding or salsa dancing, and I'd certainly steer clear of running up and down the beach in tight white shorts. But my favorite feature has to be your revolutionary flexi wings. <laughs> Kudos on being the only company smart enough to realize how crucial it is that the maxi pads be aerodynamic. <laughs> I can't tell you how safe and secure I feel each month, month knowing there's a little F-16 in my pants. <laughs> Have you ever had a menstrual period, Mr. Thatcher? Ever suffered from the curse? I'm guessing you haven't. Well, see, my time of the month is starting right now. As I type, I can already feel hormonal forces violently surging through my body. Just a few minutes from now, my body will adjust and I'll be transformed into what my husband likes to call an inbred hillbilly with knife skills. Isn't the human body amazing? As brand manager of the Feminine Hygiene Division, you've no doubt seen quite a bit of research on what exactly happens during your customers' monthly visits from Aunt Flo. Therefore, you must know about the bloating, the puffiness, and cramping we endure, and about our intense mood swings, crying jags, and out-of-control behavior. You surely realize it's a tough time for most women. In fact, only last week, my, my friend Jennifer fought the violent urge to shove her boyfriend's testicles into a George Foreman grill just because he told her that he thought Grey's Anatomy was written by drunken chimps. Crazy! The point is, sir, you of all people must realize that America is just crawling with homicidal mani maniacs in capri pants. Which brings me to the reason for my letter. Last month, while in the throes of cramping so painful I wanted to reach inside my body and yank out my uterus, I opened an always, a box of always maxi pads, and there, printed on the adhesive backing, were these words. Have a happy period. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> what I mean is, does any part of your tiny, middle manager brain think happiness, actual smiling, laughing happiness, is possible during a menstrual period? Did anything mentioned above sound the least bit pleasurable? Well, did it, James? FYI, unless you're some kind of sick S&M freak girl, there will never be anything happy about a day in which you have to jack yourself on a Motrin and, and Kalula. Kalua, and lock yourself in your house just so you don't march down to the local Walgreens armed with a hunting rifle and a sketchy plan to end your life in a blaze of glory. For the love of God, pull your head out, man. If you just have to slap a romantic message or moronic message on a maxi pad, wouldn't it make more sense to say something that's actually pertinent, like put down the hammer or <laughs> vehicular manslaughter is wrong? <laughs> or are you just picking on us? <laughs> Sir, Please inform your accounting department that, effective immediately, there will be an $8 drop in monthly profits, for I have chosen to take my maxi pad business elsewhere. And, I, and though I will certainly miss your flexi wings, I will not for one minute miss your brand of condescending bullshit. And that's a promise I intend to keep, always. <laughs> Again, that is one of my favorite open letters that I have ever found on the internet, and that was brought to me by a toolbar that is from the devil called Stumble Upon. Oh. Anybody out there? Anybody out there had that brand of insomnia? Oh yeah, for a very, very long time. You need a pin or something. I'm telling you, get a chit on a keychain. I think you deserve that. I think it's hard to avoid toolbars anymore, but let's see. I'm trying to decide. And of course now Firefox would take the time to update. It's been that kind of day. <laughs> so um, I know I have always got more to talk about. Um, the question is, anybody want to hear it? Or do we want to just go with my open letters? Of course we want to hear it. All righty. All righty. Um, I was actually having a discussion with somebody the other day. Because I'm, I'm starting this new job. Today was my actual orientation, even though my first day was last Wednesday. So I'm marching into orientation going, yeah, I know where all this is, and the Chick-fil-A is over there, and I'm just going to avoid that. It's like the plague. And uh, 
everyone else is all starry-eyed, no idea where they're going. But I had had this discussion with a couple of people about, you know, I don't really want to work phone support. I really don't like the phones, but I figure it's a baby step to go from a, a job I didn't particularly like and a company I didn't particularly like to a company I enjoyed, but a job I didn't like. So it's a baby step forward. But I was really thinking that if I was going to have to work a phone job, it might be kind of fun to be in collections because I can be a bit of an asshole. <laughs> And I'm told that you get a percentage of the money that you collect, so I was kind of daydreaming about that a little bit recently. But I think one of my favorite help desk stories, and again, this is something that I posted under help desk to fuck. <laughs> I don't know what your worst story is if you've ever worked in a uh, support role, but I think perhaps the worst one was when uh, I managed to out my boss for stepping out on his wife by following procedure. Yeah, I didn't last long at that company. But um, we had a very temperamental product. It was web-based. And this particular one liked to crash frequently. And uh, I was hired to work the, the last shift. So for the last hour that our particular help desk was open, it was just me on the phones. And it was a Friday night, I believe. And let me let me go backwards and tell you a little bit about this particular, this particular department. Um, the supervising manager was a former Marine. He had a habit or his uh, management style included yelling, screaming, throwing office furniture, and leaving condescending notes on your keyboard to find when you came into the office. So I don't believe that that was in any manuals on how to be a proper manager, but it was still how he operated nonetheless. Uh, he also staffed his department quite interestingly. Now, when you think of a help desk, I'm guessing you don't think of 20-something tall, busty, blonde women as typically. I mean, I'm not talking about what you dream about at night if you wanted to be a, you know, a help desk supervisor. I'm talking normally your help desk employee is somebody like Moss from the IT crowd. Have you turned it off and on again? And I say that lovingly, having spent the better part of the last 12 years on a help desk. So, but uh, this was a small department. It was six people, and it was entirely women. The only men on this particular help desk were the boss and the boss's crony. And I say that and mean it in, the, in that sense. Uh, there were a division between the, the six of us. There was the cool kids that were tall and busty and blonde and uh, in with the boss. And then there were the other three of us that were your typical weirdos, you know. So, yeah, whatever. We were getting paid pretty well. I didn't care. But it was very common for the cool kids to cut out an hour or so early and go out and get a beer. And it was so common that we really didn't even think about it. Um, it just happened that one particular Friday, we had an outage on our flagship website product. And the procedure was that you needed to call the cell phone of the boss, and if he didn't answer, leave a message, and then call his backup. If he didn't answer, leave a message, and then call the home number for the, uh, the big boss, the, the guy that you called first. No answer there, you call the supervisor's home number. Now, the intention was that it was never supposed to get that far because there was no, not tertiary, what's the next number? Quaduciary, something, fiduciary, yeah. That, what she said. That's what she said, yeah, I, I said it. Um, so it was never intended to get that far, but because it was Friday and everybody had been gone for a while, when this particular website went down, called the first number, no answer called the second number, no answer. No surprise, because the cool kids and the management were out together. Now, there was one particular woman that we worked with, tall, blonde, busty. Uh, there were rumors everywhere that there was something going on there, because they would go to long lunches frequently, and she would um, cajole him by saying you know his first middle and last names when they were you know m mock fighting in the office so it was 
they were rumors, but it was easy to believe that they were true. And uh, so yeah, they were all out at the bar one evening, and I eventually had to call the boss's house following procedure. And if you ever had a conversation with somebody and you can feel the temperature in the room drop, I managed to have that over the phone. So I call and a woman answers, and is the only person I can imagine to be his wife. And I asked, is so-and-so there? And a chill filled the air. No, he's still at work, is what I'm told. Now I know this to not be true, because I watched them march out the door and say, we're going to the bar, I'll see you later. So here I am, stuck in my office chair till 6 p.m., trying to figure out how to cover for not only myself, but the boss. Because being the type of manager where he would throw office furniture and, uh, and have some very unprofessional words to say, I didn't really need <laughs> to be the one that broke it to his wife that he was stepping out on her. And yet that's kind of what happened. <laughs> I should also notice that in the particular subdivision where I was living at the time, his house was three down from one of the main exits. So there was really no way of avoiding the man <laughs> except to go out of my way. So yeah, that's the reason why my employment at that particular company didn't last very long because I believe that was a Friday and starting the next Monday, it was very, very uncomfortable to work there. So yeah, I managed to uh, follow procedure and, and out my boss to is cheating on his wife. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you at all, but uh, that, was, that was one of those fun moments in customer service. So. <laughs> and yet I still do it. And yet I worked for a government help desk where I was what I like to call a professional masochist for five years. So, anyway, that's what I've got for you this evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, next up will be Dave, but before I've got to shill a few things, uh, the Cancer Society, we have the picture out, so please throw some money that way. Um, when it flips by again, it'll say, Opportunities for Artists, have a look. The Nebraska Art Foundation, hold on, I've lost the word, it's the NEC. Council. Thank you, there's the word. They will be here t this week. Uh, they're gonna be giving a quick talk on uh, grant and presentation opportunities for artists within Nebraska, and followed up by Q and A session and some networking time. So please join us here for that. And uh, you'll see the other shows flashing by. Thanks again to Dominicat for sponsoring us. And here's Dave. At this point in time, uh, due to one set of circumstances or another, um, why don't we take about 15 minutes, we'll call it an intermission, and then I will do my set. So, and then it'll be myself and Chris Wig, who I'm intensely jealous of because um, he's me except he has talent. And he also has an internet fan club, which I don't, which I'm totally for. <laughs> so, let me see, it's that time now. 15 minutes from now. <laughs>